the people making these videos against these systems have never trained this stuff. And yeah, I mean, you can look up a video on YouTube and watch it and think that you're some sort of expert, but you're not. And sometimes the arguments that you come up with tend to be a little bit stupid. This is not an armchair review of these systems. My knowledge of them comes from countless hours of training, of all the blood, sweat, tears, bumps, bruises, over the course of 11 years. I've also been training martial arts for over 30 years, so I feel like I have something to compare this to. Among other black belts that I've gotten through various other systems, traditional and otherwise, I also have my black belt in Defense Lab. I've trained in person with Andy, Greg, and Ruben a number of different times, one of which was also in Spain. I've also had the opportunity to train with Justo several times, including his first trip back to the States after COVID. I've also trained with multiple brown belts and other high-ranking individuals from the original KFM system. This video is gonna share my honest, measured insights that come from actually being within the system instead of just watching a video and making quick snap judgments on it. So I want to thank you for being here. It means a lot to me for me to be able to share my martial arts passion with other people who, who share and match that passion. Stay tuned until the end of the video to where I get to poke holes in some of those extremely stupid arguments on how DL and KFM and Casey don't work. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is probably what DL and, and KC and KFM are most known for, and that's gonna be their, their guard, their pincedor, their shape one, call it what you will. So the general consensus, especially coming from people who may not quite know exactly what it is that they're, they're talking about, is that the guard for these systems is somehow inferior. And this is one of the things that, that, that really needs to be discussed because this is what the whole system is built off of. So in case you don't know, the Pensador is a full out helmet type guard for the head. And the idea behind this is to be able to protect all your major knockout points. You have the knockout points in the jaw, in the neck, back of the head, in the temples. The idea here is that if I get hit in the head, the computer goes out and I can't control my body. I'm out, I'm done, I've lost the fight. The idea behind the guard is, is multifaceted. The first one is, is that I'm gonna do everything I can to use structure to protect all of these knockout points. The second one is, is that I'm able to put myself in a position to where not only can I protect myself, but I can also attack at the same time. Now, here's where context comes into play, and this is why it's so important. You see videos of people picking this apart saying that, well, if I put my hands here, I'm protecting the hard part of my head, and that doesn't make sense, and I'm using my hands to protect this hard part of my head, and what I should really do is put these hands in front of my face so I'm taking the same amount of damage. Now, the reason why I say this is lack of understanding is because this is not what we're doing at all. What we are doing is we are taking our hands to the back of our head and we're using the forearms and we're using the elbows to be able to provide this protection. And if I have the chance to get hit in the jaw or if I have the chance to get hit in the elbow, I think I'm going to take the elbow. Now, when it comes to the Pensador, there are different variations and different evolutions on how we can apply this. The one that most of the people see are with the hands on top of the head and the elbows coming in tight here. There are other variations where I actually take my hand to my wrist and go more towards the side of the head. And I can do this on both sides. You may have also seen the one where the hand goes on the inside of the bicep and I come up here. Again, there are multiple different variations for multiple different reasons that provide the same amount of protection. Now, one of the reasons why the Pensador is used is because it's keyed off of your body's natural reaction. One of your body's natural reactions when things are flying into your face, when you're not quite overwhelmed, is to almost reach out for this. And this is where systems like Krav Maga flourish because all of your defenses are based off of the natural reaction to reach out to something, whether it's coming in on a straight line and I turn it into an inside defense, or if it's coming in for more 
rounded type attack and I turn it into a 360. But your body's natural reaction to reach out is what that system uses. When you're overwhelmed, and you can look up videos on YouTube where people are getting stomped on from like four different people or there's eight fists flying at their face or something like that. When you get overwhelmed, your body's natural reaction is to kind of shell up and cover up to protect your head. What the Pensador does is it keys off of this particular natural reaction of, oh my God, things are coming in at all different ranges. I have to cover up. We're using this as a way to fully protect our head and we're using structure. Once you've trained this a few times and once you start learning the ins and outs of the Pensador, then it starts turning into attack to where these fists or these feet or whatever are flying into my head. And I'm not just going to sit here and take all this pressure because we also know that that's only going to last so long. Once these things start coming in, I'm actually going to cover up my head and then I'm going to start using this to attack. And then that way, in this type of scenario, I could turn the cards back into my favor. So the next thing I want to talk about, and, and really I want to address it because I hear this argument all the time. And if you go online and, and look on YouTube and look up videos from, again, people who have no idea what they're talking about, the same point comes up. Well, if you're doing this high guard here, what happens to the rest of your body? Your ribs are open, your groin's open, so on and so forth. And I want to address this and we're going to kind of walk and talk it. On the outside, it does look like if I'm here and I go to cover my head here, that the rest of my body is open. Now, if only the guys who spent 30 plus years putting this system together would have thought of that. This is where context and understanding come in because from this position here, I'm already working my way into a lower stance. When you're in a scenario where there are multiple people around you, you don't want to be standing taller than them. You don't want to be standing upright. You're easy to take down. You're easy to be attacked, so on and so forth. The lower I get, the more stability I have but also it makes it a little bit harder to hit me. From here, I am blocking my head in a way that's keeping my head covered and protected. Now, I can use this for a highline attack. If I'm in a situation where I'm worried about my ribs or I'm worried about my groin, we have the same check kicks that you would see in other systems like, like Muay Thai and stuff like that, where I'm here and I just check this kick. However, I can also use the same guard to help protect my ribs. If I'm in this position here and something is coming into my ribs, I just duck this down. If it's coming to the other side, I do the same thing. I just duck this down. I drop my elbow, as you see in many other systems, to help protect the ribs. If for some reason I want to be a little bit more aggressive, I'm going to take that same shape and I'm going to attack whatever it is that's coming in. So you see, just because we're up here blocking our head doesn't mean that we're neglecting the rest of our body. That would be ludicrous. But from here, I can use the same guard using the same type of stance and protect my entire body. But also keep in mind, and this is the most important part, we're not just standing here and taking all this damage and not doing anything back. If I'm here and I'm in a situation where I have to employ this guard. I'm not just going to sit there and not try to overwhelm with aggression and take the fight back to the person. If I have to cover my head from this position, I'm already moving forward and I'm already attacking. This is the thing that you want to remember is that, yeah, it's a guard, but it's also an attack. So going back into talking about this stance and I kind of touched on it and I want to elaborate just a little bit more. The stances that you see in Defense Lab that you see in KC and, and KFM are going to be a bit lower. Now, there's context behind this, something that you, you really need to understand. From this low stance, one of the things that I do want to talk about is it's really hard to operate the, the bottom half of your body as you would see a kickboxer, which means that I'm not going to be throwing all of these kicks because the maneuverability is just not going to be there. One of the things that you do want to remember is that that's not what this system was built for to begin with. The system was built for when you're surrounded, when you're having to fight multiple opponents, or when you're so overwhelmed that you're already at that point of disadvantage. Again, when that happens, I do want to drop that base a little bit, especially if I have multiple people around me. That way I have more of a stability here and I'm going to use the footwork and I'm going to use the guards to be able to close in and do whatever it is that I need to do. But you're not going to be able to just like 
maneuver like you would see somebody maybe in FMA. And you're not going to be able to throw the types of kicks that you would see Muay Thai kickboxers or somebody else throw. One of the things that really drew me to this system is its focus on fighting from the point of disadvantage. Up to this point in my martial arts career, I had never seen this before, and especially fighting from different levels of combat. Now you see all the stuff that is happening from that standing position, but that's only a small part of what it is that we actually train. From that standing position, we also go into a kneeling position. So from this position here, I'm actually gonna go and kneel down and then we learn how to fight from here. Now, obviously the, the idea is not to stay here. We also learn how to make connections and stand back up, but we do get really comfortable being in a position here, especially when we have four or five different other training partners that are raining shots down on us and we have to protect ourselves. But again, this is only a small part. From here, we also go to a seated position. And from here, I make the transition and I could be down on the ground here or I could be here in the middle and we'd learn how to fight from here. Also, we learn how to go all the way down to a laying position to where we're here and we have four people around us and, and maybe they're stomping down on us, maybe they're renting shots, maybe we're just focusing on how to make a connection and stand back up. Learning how to fight from this position, in my opinion, is absolutely essential because Otherwise, what do you have? A wish of good luck and, and maybe a, a miracle arm bar? I mean, you have to be able to learn how to defend yourself if people are stomping down on you, or you have to learn how to stand back up effectively in a way that's gonna leave you protected, but also on the offensive. So from these types of positions, we learn how to operate. We learn how to, to up the stress to where the chaos is really high, but you're learning on how to keep your cool and keep your head. You're also learning how to fight back no matter what position that you're given, because let's face it, when it comes to the actual self-defense, we're not always going to be awarded the, the most opportune position to fight from. So in the process of learning how to fight from positions of disadvantage, you also learn how to fight from other different types of disadvantage. This could be the number of attackers that you're going to have. This could be the type of space that you're uh, that you're operating in. It could be very confined. This can also be if you're already stuck into that infighting type scenario. So even though we're learning how to fight from these different positions up to and including laying down on our back, you have to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And, and this isn't a shit on jujitsu. I train jujitsu regularly and I absolutely love jujitsu. However, it is a little bit of a different world. Instead of having to worry about just that one person, even in the training scenario, you're going against two, three, four people. And why you are trying to accomplish something with one training partner, your other training partners are simultaneously, literally stomping on you and hitting you and all this kind of stuff to keep that reality in your mind of if I try to lock him up or if I try to grapple him or if I get too complacent, somebody's going to stomp on my head. And it really brings a whole different avenue to the training because yeah, some of the stuff that you do in jujitsu may be, uh, may be useful in these types of scenarios. However, you're always paying attention to keeping yourself protected, but also keeping yourself on the offense and trying to stand up as quickly as possible. One of the other things that I have found a lot of benefit within the system is its emphasis on body mechanics. Now, it's not all standing straight up and down and just throwing punches and kicks and all of this kind of thing. You actually learn how to incorporate your entire body into every punch, every kick, every shape, every elbow, and the way that this is done, and it's very specific, and it's kind of, um, the this system is the only place that I've ever seen it, is you're actually using a rolling type body mechanic, and you're learning how to get that rhythm, and you're learning how to get that timing, and you're learning how to incorporate that into every single punch or, or attack that you do. Um, a lot of what benefit that I've gotten from it is is just doing boxing type drills. So you see boxers and how they move their head and how they're able to get offline and how they're still able to strike with absolute pre precision. What DL has done is they've taken these these drills and these these 
remarkably similar body mechanics and have incorporated it into the system. So you're learning how to be a destructive force of nature, but you're also learning how to be able to move your head and move your body and do so in a way that's going to make you hit 10 times harder than what you would otherwise. One of the things that I also appreciate about the mechanics of the system, the, the body mechanics of the system, is the focus is on everything that you do, whether it's a drag step, a step through, a punch, a transition, everything that you do is meant to cause some kind of damage to the other person. If I grab onto you, I'm grabbing onto you to rip your skin off. If I'm doing a drag step to kind of close that distance, I'm doing a simultaneous foot stomp. If I'm on the inside and I feel my knee touch your knee, I'm actually gonna tweak your knee to throw you off balance a little bit to make it a little bit easier for, for me to hit you. And again, this is one of those things that I really appreciate about this system because everything is an attack. There's not a single thing that you do within the fight. There's no wasted motion and not wasted motion in the JKD kind of way to where everything is simplistic and, and more or less in a straight line, but no wasted motion, meaning that if I have to make a transition or I have to turn or, or anything that I do is meant to attack that other person. Now, what this does is... It, your aggression is on full time, but also one of the things that I noticed within the years that I spent training is that it starts doing something to your mind a little bit. When you start looking at things in the view of no matter what I do in this conflict, in this confrontation, it's going to be an attack. You start getting a little bit more primal. You start getting a little bit more aggressive and, and you start seeing things more. You start seeing different connections. You start seeing different ways to, to hit somebody and to tweak somebody's body to, to, to help you to prevail through whatever type of situation that you're in. Now, let's face it. If you're in a fight, a fight is really, really fast. It's not going to be something that you're going to spend, you know, all this time on. However, it builds this creativity up in your up in your mind it builds up this imagination in your mind where you start seeing all these different things and ultimately i believe that this makes you more of effect more of an effective fighter because if you're doing something and it gets shut down if you have that creativity if you have that imagination if, if you've been going through these drills to where everything is an attack you can immediately switch to something else and you're able to prevail past that point one of the things that I found interesting with DL and with Casey and KFM is the type of striking that it uses. Now, let's face it, a punch is a punch, a kick is a kick. There are only so many different ways that you throw any type of an, an attack. Even Bruce Lee said that until a human being grows an extra arm and two extra legs, there's not going to be a whole lot of difference there. However, Keep in mind that we are working from the shapes, we are working from the pincedor, and we are working from the different types of stances and stuff that we've already talked about. And one of the things that I've heard is that if I'm covering my head from this position, it's got to compromise my striking. And in reality, that's not true. The reason being is because this is taken into an account whenever you're learning how to protect your head. Now, for example, if I have to shape onto my head and I'm in this position, whether I'm being aggressive or not, once I'm here, I have a lot of different striking options. One of the ways that, that sets DL striking off from everything else is it's angulated type striking, which means that from this position here, I'm actually going to come straight over the head and I'm coming with like a hammer fist. From this position here, I can come straight out from where I'm at in that pincedor. If I'm in a situation where I have multiple opponents and I have to strike and cover and strike and cover, I can actually cover, strike, cover, strike, strike, cover. And you learn how to flow striking from that covered up type of position. Now, with the cover being a little bit higher up on the head, you do have to learn how to throw your, your straight strikes, your punches, your jabs, your cross, your hooks, and all that kind of stuff from a higher position. If I'm down here in a, in a traditional boxing stance, my punches are coming straight out from my chin, maybe a little bit higher on my head. Now, if I'm in this position here, 
we do have those same types of strikes. You're just throwing them from this position here. One of the things that I really like about this is that even though I'm throwing this punch here, I'm not just dropping this hand back down to the low guard because again, we're keeping in mind that there's a very good chance that there's multiple people around us. So from this position here, when I go to throw this strike, I'm actually keeping this head high. It's kind of keeping something up to where I can kind of tighten up if I need to, but also if I'm in this position and say they're really close to me, I can actually throw this punch out. I can start addressing the person in front of me and I can make some kind of contact with this person next to me. That way I have a little bit of a blueprint of where I may be going next. I find that to be super beneficial because I'm not just trying to run around and stack my opponents that way when they do finally take me over, I'm really tired and out of breath. But at the same time, I'm not just sitting here and, and boxing the guy in front of me and leaving my face completely open to where the guy next to me can hit me. I'm taking this into account to where once I cover and I strike, I can come back to that cover or I can start addressing other people if I need to be. Now, you have your jabs, you have your hooks, you have your uppercuts. All of the strikes are the same. The only difference is, is that they're coming from a higher place and they're also being thrown with the intention of, I may have to cover up towards the side against another opponent. So obviously there's a lot about these systems that I really appreciate, that I enjoy, that I really admire. However, there's also a few things that I think need to be improved. And in the interest of giving you a full in-depth understanding of what these systems are, I, I probably need to include those as well. No system is perfect. Not a single system out there. All of them have their flaws and, and DL, KC, KFM, they're no different. One of the things that I feel like needs a lot of improvement is the, the focus on the US. And what I mean by this is, is I was lucky enough to come at come up at the time that I did. When I first started it was in 2012 and I went in right before they were making the switch where, where old KFM kind of split up and, and they went into KC and DL. Andy went and did his thing, Husto went and did his thing. Um, at that time, there was a really great support system. Uh, even when I made the transition into to Defense Lab, there were instructor camps three four five six times a year there were higher ranked students that were north american directors so to speak uh, that were running these training camps and and andy and, and and greg and ruben and all of the guys they would make regular trips to the united states and and so getting the training with with the source so to speak was not really hard to do so really where this started to break down, and, and this happens to a lot of dynasties you'll see, uh, is, is just internal drama. Everybody had their own little things going on. One director was doing this and it was bad for him and bad for the business. And, and so he was kind of exiled. And then you had another uh, director that was doing this and it was bad for him and bad for the business. And so he was kind of exiled. And so the, the support system really kind of ate itself. And it was to the point where, you know, the, the only source of higher training that you can go to really didn't care about being there in the first place. And so that broke down as well. So, and over these last few years, and part of it is because of finances and part of it is because of interest and so on and so forth, um, there hasn't been that type of support system. There is no North American director anymore. And, and, and right now, uh, it's almost like every instructor is on his own. Now, you get an amazing support system as far as communication goes. The portal itself, where all of your training is located online, um, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Now, if you know what you're doing and if you, you've spent time with these guys and you've spent time with people who have, have been doing this for quite some time, the resources is second to none. However, if you're a brand new instructor and you've never trained these types of things, um, 
it is a little bit confusing and you're not going to get the full essence. The only hope you really have is to be able to go to Spain and train with these guys in person. And let's face it, not everybody can do this. So as far as, as support goes for the US, it leaves a lot to be desired for. Another issue that I find in this, and again, this is coming from uh, being able to have other systems of which I've trained in other systems that I've, I've gotten pretty far in to be able to kind of hold it as a comparison. Uh, Defense Lab does have its own type of, of weapons focus. And to me, this kind of leads a lot to be desired for. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes what tends to happen is you get this idea of, of having something is better than having nothing. And to an extent, I could kind of see this point. However, when you try to build that something as something fresh and something new, there's a reason why certain systems have been around as long as they have. Take Pekiti Tersha Kali, for example. This system has been around for a very long time. And the reason why is because its focus is, is, is very focused. But also, they're really good at what they do. They don't try to be something else for somebody else. They have their focus on the blade and they keep that focus on the blade. In my honest opinion, I think Defense Lab is phenomenal when it comes to empty hand fighting. I think it is phenomenal when it comes to having a fight against multiple opponents. You don't have to be everything for everybody and that's okay. One of the things that, that sets it apart is its focus on being able to, to, to strike at the same time that you're defending yourself in a way that's natural, in a way that's allowing you to keep yourself protected. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to fighting with a knife or when it comes to a knife defense to be a legitimate system. You're good at what you do. Stick to that. One of the other issues that I found is that sometimes context is lost within the drill. And what I mean by this is when it comes to Defense Lab, you have different types of drills that it is that you're trying to do. Sometimes you're just working on building up attributes and every system needs this. Every system has to have a way of perfecting the movements that you're trying to make. But you also have what are considered as fight drills. And what these are, is these are for getting you ready for the fight. And these drills don't necessarily need to try to mix together because it's not going to achieve its purpose. There's a lot of drills and Defense Lab is, is great about coming up with a whole lot of drills for you to do a whole lot of different ways of training these different movements. However, the distinction is not always made on what is actually building up that attribute and what is actually getting you prepared for that fight. You'll see strikes that are going to the thigh or to the hip or you'll see a strike going to the wrist and, and you don't quite understand the context behind that because it's not laid out for you. Now again, if you've been in it for a while and you've trained with the guys in person, you start to understand these things because that's where they tell you. However, if you're doing this training essentially on your own or you know with somebody who hasn't really been here for a long time, you start getting lost in these drills and your end product is not going to be as effective as you really want it to be. Now, yeah, there are instances where we strike to the wrist, but it's because you put that wrist in the way and that we had to strike that. And through these attribute building drills, you learn how to go around that and then how to ultimately achieve your goal. And then you take these fight drills and you put it all into exercise where I'm throwing a punch and it's gonna hit whatever it hits, but I know where to go to from there. When you're training these drills by yourself, you don't have that context all the time. And that's where things start getting a little bit lost. So this is the portion of the video that I wanted you to stick around for because this is the portion where we're going to start talking about some of the arguments against systems like Defense Lab and Casey Fighting Method in, in Casey. And we're going to kind of poke holes in some of these arguments because the whole premise of this video was to give you an in-depth understanding from somebody who's actually trained this stuff. The people making these videos against these systems have never trained this stuff. And yeah, I mean, you can look up a video on YouTube and watch it and think that you're some sort of expert, but you're not. And sometimes the arguments that you come up with tend to be a little bit stupid. One of the things that people love to talk about is how these systems haven't been pressure tested. 
And I find this argument to be absolutely hilarious because pressure testing is like a good 60 to 65 percent of what we actually do whether it's in a class whether it's in a camp i guarantee you if you go to spain and you train with the guys who made this system that's all you're going to be doing is pressure testing because you have to know that this works you have to be able to to operate inside of that chaotic atmosphere where you have five or more people throwing punches at you and kicking you and doing all these things in order to be able to really have faith that what you're trying to pull off is actually effective. With that being said, you also have to understand that these guys aren't playing patty cake with you. They're not just trying to barely tap you as, as, as softly as they can. The, these guys, yeah, they have focus mitts on. And yes, they're wearing boxing gloves and shin pads and you know all these protective gear, but it's for protection, not necessarily for you either. Because if they throw a punch and I do my shape and they catch an elbow on the fist, it's going to hurt really bad, even when you're wearing boxing gloves. So a lot of times when you see the focus mitts and you see the boxing gloves, it's not for the protection of the guy who's actually in the middle. He is taking these full on shots while everybody else is really trying to make sure that they don't break their hand in the event that they hit an elbow or something else hard. So yeah, there is pressure testing. It's just not in front of an audience. Also, yeah, you may not see it in a ring. You may not see it in the UFC. And, and one of the things that, that people need to remember is that it was only in the 90s that jiu-jitsu really started to take hold. And this is after jiu-jitsu had been operating for quite a long time. This is still a relatively new system. And with any type of new system, it takes time for people to get in and start training it and to start seeing the benefits and all that kind of stuff. Now, granted, this isn't a system that's necessarily made for in the ring, but that doesn't mean that what we do is not gonna be able to be accomplished in a type of sport fighting scenario. So if you give it time, I guarantee you, the people are gonna see the benefit. I remember when Defense Lab first started gaining a little bit of traction and everybody was talking about how ineffective it was and how impractical it was from Krav guys to traditional guys to sport guys. And over the last few years, still being involved with the system, it's been kind of cool because all of those guys that were talking trash about it to begin with are starting to incorporate more of the movements into their very own systems. So again, over the 11 years that I've spent inside of this system, I've learned a lot and I've been able to, to, to gain a lot of different attributes as a fighter, as a martial artist, as somebody who trains other things on top of this. I've learned how to use my body better. I've learned to hit harder. I've learned a little bit more unorthodox ways of, of looking at certain types of situations. And I've learned that in giving these different levels and, and, and points of disadvantage, I've learned how to keep my head and learned how to take care of myself. And I think that's one of the most important things is at the end of the day, it's important to be able to put yourself in a position to, to admit that you don't really know what it is that you're trying to, to learn through taking on something like this, but you put yourself in it anyway. And then you try to approach it with an open mind and you try to pick up as much as you can, because at the end of the day, ultimately, we're trying to build ourselves to be better. And the only way that you do that is by actually putting in the work. And so the overall point, I think, is that if you're interested in self-defense, if you're interested in something different, if you're interested in a system that's going to give you a bunch of different tools to work with, Defense Lab is great. Casey is great. Casey Fighting Method is absolutely great. If you're interested in making a snap judgment, you could join everybody else who watches these videos on YouTube and, and does exactly that.